how would you uh, put uh, the importance of an amphibious aircraft as far as Indian scenario is concerned? Just imagine with the Chinese aircraft which has been tested and likely to enter service in 2020, 50 are on order and when they come in, the Chinese will be able to land because each aircraft has a capacity of uh, 60 troops, 3000 soldiers within say 3 to 4 hours anywhere on the uh, coastline or nearer our islands. Uh, whereas we do not have any capability, such capability. We don't even have the capability to come to the rescue of our ships stranded on the high seas because an amphibious aircraft can land near a ship, mm -hmm. take crew and uh, repair personnel, take spares and of course carry out search and rescue and carry out uh, surveillance missions. They can carry out cargo missions, it can transport troops, it can do us so many different things. That's why the Navy wanted it. Mm -hmm. The Navy has said since 2011 when they raised the request for information that we need an amphibious aircraft. It's uh, very sad that no progress has taken place. Mm -hmm. Now look at Maldives which has 47 amphibious aircraft although of smaller sizes mainly for tourism and for taking their citizens from island to island. And globally 20 countries are looking for the kind of amphibious aircraft which Japan has got. Okay. So, there definitely is a requirement for the Indian Navy, particularly because the Chinese have built up this uh, capability and by copying the US-2, mm -hmm. it's a bigger version of the US-2. And, 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 and we are stuck with a joint working group with the Japanese, okay. which so, has not made much progress. If you look at uh, all these three aircrafts, uh, is US-2 uh, the effective choice? Because, uh, uh, you know, if you look at the specifications, uh, they are different in all three cases, uh, AG-600, B-200, uh, the Russian one, and uh, Shinmaiwa US-2, the Japanese. You know, when the RFI was issued, these three companies responded, Canada's Bombardier, Russia's Beriev, and Japan's Shinmaiwa. All three aircraft meet the requirements. The Indian Navy's requirement is much lesser than the capabilities of all these three aircraft. But the Indian Navy has indicated and the course of events which has unfolded has indicated that the Japanese Shinmaiwa US-2 does not only meet the requirements, it's a game changer for Indian industry, for Indian tourism, for so many requirements. Mm -hmm. And that is why uh, one is actually surprised the Japanese are more keen and they are going out of the way to facilitate the sale of this aircraft to India mm -hmm. as compared to the keenness which the Indians are showing in inquiring it. There are reasons, I'll come to that. So this aircraft which meets the Indian Navy's requirement, if I'm not wrong, uh, in case of range, Indian Navy had laid down 800 nautical miles, so it meets uh, the range requirement and all the other requirements. But for tourism, Union Minister Gadkari is on record to say that out of the, uh, uh, the it, India wants to develop 111 rivers as waterways with seaplanes mm -hmm. operating. And this aircraft is suitable for that purpose as well, which will lead to, because of the joint production uh, offer given by the Japanese, which will lead to India becoming a hub for MRO of all amphibious aircraft in the Indo-Pacific region. Mm -hmm. And because it uses Rolls-Royce engines, mm -hmm. which are also used in other aircraft, and this Rolls-Royce engine is in use in many other aircraft in this region, mm -hmm. it will become a hub for servicing of these engines as well, hopefully, okay. through the offset route. So it's a game changer. Uh, there are several aspects involved here. I think uh, the Bombardier and the uh, Russian Beriev are no longer in the run because from the Japanese side, the Japanese Prime Minister over the years, whether it was the present government or the previous government in joint statements, in joint declarations, they have all said we are ready to cooperate with India offering joint production and also giving a fillip to the Indian aviation uh, industry mm -hmm. through this this uh, manufacture of the US-2 mm -hmm. and it's not only aviation industry the field will then be open to cooperate in many other high technology areas 
because Japan is a leader in aerospace engineering. Okay. So we can look forward to um, meeting this requirement as well as as well as seeing a sea change, as I might having put an, it, having an extra in edge. Indian industry scenario. You, you said that it is going to be a game changer, you know, as and when, uh, you know, these stocks are fructified and India uh, does go ahead and has uh, US-2 as part of its Indian Navy. But uh, the major important thing, and which has been reported uh, as well, is that transfer of technology is the critical question here. How do we move ahead on that aspect? Not Transfer of technology is being offered. They will be manufactured in India even before Make in India initiative was announced. The Japanese had offered to make in India for export. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to do it government to government. But you see, the problem is that the Ministry of Defense mm -hmm. was looking at it just as a search and rescue aircraft for which it is prohibitively expensive. Mm -hmm. They have not been looking at it, as you say, as a game, as a game changer. The game changer is the kind of fillip that joint production will give to industry in India, mm -hmm. to the aerospace industry, aviation industry, for export, the MRO industry. Uh, you know, one has to take a holistic view of the whole deal. Mm -hmm. And that is why in the joint working group till a few years ago, it was headed by the Department of Heavy Industry and Industrial Promotion and not by the Ministry of Defense. You see, the Japanese are offering this aircraft as a stripped-down version for search and rescue for firefighting and such benign purposes mm -hmm. because of their constitution, which prohibits uh, military activities and export. So the Japanese cabinet has given a waiver that if it is for these reasons, it can be sold abroad and manufactured abroad. Uh, and especially for India, they have given this waiver. Uh, as I said, 20 countries are looking for it, but only India has got this waiver. The Japanese do work with the Australians, the British and the Americans on joint military projects, but mm -hmm. with no other country. So if this thing happens, what you will find is the Indian industry will grow, whether it's government to government or along with private players. I hope it happens with the private players uh, as Mahindra has signed a MOU with them. Uh, but what will also happen is that when tourism industry gets a fill up, you know what will happen? There will be seaports, there will be marinas, there will be hovercraft usage. All these things will also start building up, uh, creating greater tourism poten uh, potential in India. Mm -hmm. So that is why it's a game changer. How do you look at uh, you know the way forward from here as far as Indian Navy and the requirements as pointed out by General Katoch? You see, the Japanese have said quite clearly, this is how far we can go mm -hmm. and no further. They have done from their side whatever is possible. I think if you really decide to acquire this aircraft, they are also going to give fiscal support because it is being offered at a very high price. They are prepared to lower the price and provide the funds for the joint uh, production in India. I think it is decision time now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been pending for eight years now. Uh, this is the time to decide how you want to proceed further. Already the Navy has proposed that we should acquire three of these aircraft in flyable condition. Let's first try and put it in perspective and understand what INS Imphal is. Uh, we have at the moment 11 destroyers. Uh, these are the Kolkata class, three of them. The Delhi class, three of them and the Rajput class, uh, five of them. Now, Kolkata class is the one which is designated Project 15 Alpha. And Vishakapatnam class is Project 15 B, four of which are under construction. The sanction was given in 2011 yes, for 29,340 crores, which is approximately $4 billion it will affect a saving of one billion dollars each on each of these four ships. Now, this is an improvement on the Kolkata class. Uh, it is of indigenous design. It is being made uh, by Mazagon Docks Shipbuilders Limited, so being made domestically, although we have received a lot of foreign help in its designing and some of the weapons and some of the systems and sensors. 
uh, we can come to that later. Uh, but Mezagon Dock itself now has considerable expertise right from the time when in 1968 it took on the first of the frigates to manufacture, it was the Nilgiris, mm. to now when it has made 25 ships. The challenge in making these ships is uh, integration of the weapons. Now, why is it called a guided missile destroyer? Because basically its main weapons are guided missiles. Uh, let me count them for you. It has got two magazines of 16 tubes, taking, making it uh, 32 cells which are armed with Barak 8 anti-air missiles. It also has two magazines of 8 tubes, making it 16 cells for the BrahMos land attack cruise missile or anti-surface missile. These are the main weapons. Of course, it has one 127mm Otto Melara gun. And besides that, it has got rocket launcher, the smirch kind, and a few other weapons like the close-in weapon system. But basically, it is these 32 Barak 8 and the 16 BrahMos missiles, which are its primary weapons. So it's called a guided missile destroyer. Oh. Some, peop some navies call it just a destroyer. Uh, the nomenclature, official nomenclature is DDG or the NATO nomenclature, which actually translates into designated destroyer guided. The armed forces have a habit of giving such names. Right. But basically, this is why it's a guided missile destroyer. Of course, you spoke about uh, how India has received help from outside, really, as far as indigenization is concerned. What is the kind of help that we have received? Yeah. See, for the Project 15 Bravo, they say 65% is indigenously sourced. 35% is from foreign sources. Starting with the, it is designed indigenously by the Indian Navy, the design directorate. Mm. But they took help from the uh, Russians uh, to, to actually modify and refine the hull design because of the stealth features that we wanted. And the Baltic shipyard of Russia also provided the shaft lines for all the four uh, ships of this class. Uh, then, you know, the Barak 8 missile is a joint development between India and Israel. Uh, but the uh, rocket launcher, the uh, there are uh, the, the, the Thales radar, mm. uh, some of the sensors, the AISA radar, which Ajay Banerjee spoke about, these are all foreign sourced. The BrahMos missile is a joint development, India and Russia. Dhruv helicopters are from HAL. The Hamsa sonar is from BEL, developed by DRDO. LNT played a major role, as did a lot of others from the private industry in providing the PLM software, the control panels. Uh, much of the ship management has been provided by LNT. Uh, the main gun, 127 millimeter, is an Otto Melara gun. So when you consider all these things, of course, no ship can be 100% made indigenously. Uh, there is no point when superior stuff is available. Uh, integration is a big challenge and as I said, now some of the frigates, the stealth frigates, Project 17 frigates, uh, Talwar class frigates, they were made in Russia but the Shivalik frigates were made in India. So we have a lot of experience and we have done a lot of indigenization when it came to producing all these stealth frigates uh, which are modern world standard uh, naval warships. Mm. So that experience has gone into it and today we can proudly say that even this 65% indigenous content is quite high, satisfactory and very motivating for the shipyards. Absolutely. Right. Uh, so and, and we have a large future requirement of stealth frigates, destroyers, corvettes, smaller ships, auxiliary ships, which is uh, according to the uh, naval plans this indigenization is going to play a big part in it. How does the Navy come up with these names? Is there, is there some kind of a, you know, uh, science behind it? What is it really? Well, there is a nomenclature committee 
headed by an assistant chief of naval staff in the Ministry of Defense, and they have representatives from the historical division of MOD and from the archaeological department of the Ministry of Human Resource Development. Uh, but the principle is they name ships after mountain ranges, after warriors, after cities, after weapons. And so you find like the Leander class which uh, Mezagon Dock built, mm. all of them were uh, Nilgiri and uh, you know, all the Giris are the mountain ranges. Yes. And so all the ships ended with the Giri, uh, named Vindhya Giri and things like that. There are uh, ships named after uh, cities, Delhi, Mysore, Kolkata. There are ships named after uh, weapons, Tir and uh, uh, Kukri. There are uh, the rivers, Godavari and uh, Bias and so on. So I think it is recognizing the diversity of India when you name ships. And that is why Imphal has been selected. Imphal is a city uh, in the northeast which was the a battlefield in World War II and it recognizes the valor of the army and it recognizes the contribution of the northeastern states. So I think it's a good gesture. But in conclusion, let me just say one thing. Yeah, sure. Uh, something leading on from what Ajay Banerjee said. It's uh, time we considered the Chinese model and took on manufacturing frigates and destroyers on an assembly line. Chinese have manufactured 50 copies and 60 copies of a particular destroyer or frigate. When you find that the design is proven, it is effective, it is modern, why have three ships made here and four ships made in Russia? I suppose the requirement is that uh, we take too much of time and we need ships in a hurry. So let the foreign shipyards make them. But if you have an assembly line, definitely things will come off faster and you will get quality stuff and you will get standardized stuff if you have one type of frigates and one type of destroyers and one type of corvettes. How did this all move about and come to this stage when uh, the uh, arrested landing has been tested successfully? Firstly, we couldn't have had a better expert than Admiral Sinha uh, talking about this subject. Um, he's the one who's been involved personally in this project right from its beginning. Uh, and what he has said, I would like to take on from there. Where are we today? A arrested landing has been demonstrated in the last few days at uh, the Naval Air Station. But what Admiral Sinha had in mind when the project took off and what is happening today is the moot point. This arrested landing is a major milestone in the history of naval aviation. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very glad that the Navy backs it as it does the Kaveri engine also. And I am very happy that despite all the delays, we are going towards developing indigenous capability which is possessed only by USA, Russia, UK, France and now China. Mm -hmm. Uh, hopefully, India will be added to it when the complete development takes place. But you know, the idea was that the LCA Navy would be developed on the Mark II. This is now being tested on Mark I. Mark II has not yet been developed. So, this uh, development and trial will start again with Mark II. Of course, this is the journey towards a Mark II naval variant. Mm -hmm. But what is it intended for? This uh, only aircraft carrier we have at the moment, Vikramaditya, is going to be there till let's say 2030 and the MiG-29Ks are already operating with this aircraft carrier. Will it replace them? Well, replacement for the uh, indigenous aircraft carrier that is INS Vikrant, which is a similar kind of aircraft carrier like Vikramaditya. Mm -hmm. Will it be for that? can't say at the moment how this journey of development will take place. Okay. Because at the same time, two years ago, RFI was issued for carrier-borne, 57 carrier-borne aircraft with uh, the F-18A Hornet in mind, with the Rafale in mind, and with the uh, MiG-29K in mind. Mm -hmm. Now, those aircraft are all uh heavier heavier types they they uh, have uh, twin engines 
and they are they can be good for the third aircraft carrier which we are going to develop that is Vishal because it's a much bigger aircraft carrier but it might have a different launch system and uh, landing system so it might happen that like in the case of Vikramaditya the MiG-29 case may came much earlier mm -hmm. the Vikramaditya itself came much later and then they were used for land-based training until Vikramaditya arrived will the LCA Mark II naval be ready will it be ready in such a time frame that Vikrant is still operational well mm -hmm. possible and it can be used on that but it may not be fit for Vishal which will have uh, uh, the uh, the emails or the electrical and magnetic uh, launch system and uh, so where where does it stand now and those aircraft which are being acquired will they be acquired which can come within six years okay remember when mig-29 development started it was uh, it was given up because the soviet union collapsed but overall the complete uh, time taken was 12 years mm -hmm. so it is quite possible that tejas mark ii naval will also take another 8 to 10 years or 12 years from now until it is induction inducted into service okay so these are uh, these are the points to which our uh, attention goes and these must be highlighted india requires a integrated approach from the government side to give philip to the naval aerospace or otherwise also overall aerospace industry mm -hmm. and also engine manufacturing how things might uh, move ahead in the times to come and what would be required to be done yes plenty of challenges look at china first we started our career born journey in 1961 i think the chinese started much later 1987 they already have three uh, aircraft carriers under construction of course one can question their ethics uh, for their carrier aircraft they copied the su-33 and developed the j-15 by the way j-15 uh, cannot take off from the ski jump with its full load they, they are not perfect yet mm -hmm. but they copied that design they developed the j-15 and they are having problems it can only operate with lesser weight they even copied uh, rather i would say they bought four uh, decommissioned carriers one from australia couple of them from russia and the varyag from russia they developed into the launing uh, that hull is very old so, but whatever it is, they are now ahead of us. Three aircraft carriers, one operating, second under sea trials, third under construction. And as uh, Ajay said, in the next 10 years, they might have six of them, mm -hmm. maybe more. Um, our uh, naval chief the other day said, uh, in a decade, they may have 10 aircraft carriers. We are still trying to fund the third aircraft carrier, which is on paper only. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be different. 65,000 tons planned displacement with a, with a Catobar system. Catobar is entirely different. That's the challenge. If the LCA is going to be used on that, you know, the, any aircraft launched with a catapult is totally different kettle of fish, mm -hmm. different uh, kind of stresses working on it. Uh, and generally, it is believed to be for much bigger aircraft. So as uh, admiral sina said which aircraft carrier is it for second is the engine although he mentioned g41 uh, ge414 should meet the requirement but uh, as ajay said mark 2 is going to be much heavier. heavier and if it has to do multi purpose roles the ge414 and i remember uh, admiral anun prakash saying once will not suffice you might require a different engine. If you require a different engine, you will have to go back to the drawing board. What will you do with the design of the LCA then? Mm -hmm. So there are many challenges. I hope uh, they keep at it. The answer is not does not lie in acquiring a ready-made aircraft from the West or Russia. This is the mistake we did with the HF-24. It was underpowered. Uh, we didn't develop an engine for it. The HF-24 was shelved. Then one fine day we decided to make the Kaveri engine from the DRDO the GTRE did develop an engine it was overweight it did not deliver the thrust required but thereafter there have been talks with British with French and even lately this year with Safran 
uh, which have been given up on the issue of cost. Mm -hmm. Damn it! This is a issue of this is a this is a development of national importance. Let's spend money one time. I know there is lack of money. Even the third aircraft carrier is going to cost seventy thousand crore rupees. The uh, you know the Kaveri engine for developing it into a world class engine fit for multi purpose use is also going to cost twenty thirty thousand rupees. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is why there is a reluctance from the government to commit at this moment. This okay. is leading to delays. Delays means more cost, uh, escalation. But we must keep at it, I think, for the aero engine. You know, the HAL has produced 5,000 engines so far, but they are all been licensed assembly. Mm -hmm. And they have overhauled 18,000 engines. They are the nominated center for overhauling some of the foreign engines also. Mm -hmm. But that is all... Uh, you know, expertise in just putting them together. It is not in metallurgy, it is not in aerodynamics, it is not in tooling, machining. Uh, developing aero engines requires a different uh, kind of skill altogether and, and the design. Okay. We, we should take the help of the Japanese. They are far ahead in aero engine design. Many of the uh, aero engine manufacturers are okay. absolutely reluctant to part with the technology, but we should be able to get. So, uh, aircraft and aero engine uh, is the is the challenge uh, okay. for our aerospace industry. Okay. General, we should not continue to depend on the MiG 29K. There have been a lot of adverse comments, even from the controller and auditor general, about its serviceability, about engines being rejected, about its avionics, fly-by-wire mm -hmm. system. Uh, we should we should not depend on the uh, Hornet and the Rafale and the uh, uh, MiG-29 again from Russia in the new tender because that will set in lethargy in developing our own. Even if we can come up with a naval fighter uh, which is say underpowered or which needs more development, we should give Philip an encouragement to our own development so that we can improve upon it further and there is no sh other shortcut but to develop our own fighters and our own aero engines. Let me begin with you, General Arora. Let's try and understand the naval gun systems and uh, the Mark 45, which we're talking about here. You know, for some, it may be a little unusual that we are going in for this 127 millimeter gun, 13 of them for 11 of our ships. That means one gun to a ship and two others, one for operational training and one for maintenance training. But I want to bring out something which has been happening over the last uh, one, uh, 70 years. Uh, in the Second World War, the Germans had a big battleship called Bismarck. And those of my vintage would remember that in 1960, a uh, movie came, his name was Sink the, Mis Sink the Bismarck. And in that, they showed an engagement between the Bismarck and a British ship called Hood and uh, where they uh, showed a battle and the hood went down and uh, two aircraft were also lost on the British side, which was an imaginary engagement. It did not actually happen mm -hmm. in real. But uh, one singer, Johnny Harton, made a song and it's, some people remem may remember it. Uh, in May of 1941, the war had just begun. The Germans had the biggest ships, they had the biggest guns. The Bismarck was the fastest ship that ever sailed the seas. Mm -hmm. On her deck were guns as big as stairs and shells as big as trees. That's how it goes and it further goes on to describe the engagement. This Bismarck had eight 15-inch guns which translates to 380 millimeter diameter. 12 5.9-inch guns which is... Uh, Again, you know, 150 millimeter, much more than 127, which we are talking about today. Mm -hmm. And it had 16, 4.1 inch guns. The 5.9 and 4.1 were secondary batteries and the 15 inch guns were the primary batteries. That time the radar had just about come in. The ships depended on guns, mortars, depth charges. Then cut to... Uh, 1971 mm -hmm. and our Navy Day which uh, 4 December uh, is celebrated as the day when the Indian Navy went out 
and bombarded uh, Karachi. Uh, that was the second half of the previous century when there was uh, more focus on missiles. This was the weapon used by the navies. The guns were actually going out. But today the guns are back because the guns now have radar, fire control, precision ammunition, much better sensors. And this one gun alone which we are going for per frigate is going to play wonders. Now, on 4 December, 25 mm -hmm. missile boat under Commander uh, Yadav uh, carrying three missile boats, Nilpat, Nirghat and Veer accompanied by two corvettes, uh, Kachal and Kilton, went and bombed Karachi, the oil farms, which were ablaze for seven days. And they sank one Pakistani minesweeper, Muhafiz, and a destroyer, Khyber, and a, a merchant vessel also. Mm -hmm. But uh, now, we do have missiles and we do have guns. The, missile, the, the Indian Navy ships, as other navies also al around the world, are armed with missiles as well as guns. So, both have got equal importance. Although 127 Mark 45 is not going to be the primary weapon, we have the Barak 8 on many ships, which is a long-range surface-to-air missile. Okay. Before this, we had the Barak 1. We have Brahmos land attack uh, cruise missile. And uh, we have guns, we have, uh, um, you know, anti-aircraft, smaller caliber anti-aircraft guns, we have torpedoes, we have rocket launchers, and in some cases, mortars and depth charges. Okay. So, these are now available, and now we have to look at 127 millimeter, uh, which has come in recently. There is a background to the best gun in the world is considered to be Otto Melara 127 millimeter. Mm -hmm which we were going to contract, but we had to give that up because it came un the company came under cloud in one of the Augusta Westland uh, scandals. And uh, so we banked upon the Americans to get this gun. Looking at the gun specifically, what are the characteristics, what are the specifications, and what are the utilizations? Okay. See, a 127mm gun is ideal for this primary role is naval gunfire support and against other ships. Secondary role is against aerial targets. So, navies all over the world tend to use for their different roles calibers from 30 millimeter to 127 millimeter. In the case of these naval guns of high caliber, the 6 inch or say uh, 135 millimeter or so is the maximum caliber you have today. Mm -hmm. So, 5-inch gun, this one, is considered to be ideal for shore bombardment to support an amphibious force. Uh, I have been an uh, amphibious force commander, brigade commander, and I have carried out many exercises with the Navy. Uh, we have had 76 millimeter guns, which are also ideal, but 127 is the best gun suited for naval gunfire support. Okay. In support of amphibious or against shore targets or against ships. In the secondary role, with the kind of ammunition available today, again, it's a very good gun. So, it can carry out anti-piracy roles, where 30 millimeter to 127 millimeter can be used. It can carry out warning fire against anybody else intimidating a naval force. It can carry out naval gunfire support. It can carry out anti-aerial or anti-aircraft. And it can carry out Littoral warfare against fast-moving patrol craft along the littoral. So, for all this, it is the ideal weapon if you talk about the role. Now, why is it better suited than a missile? Because all ships have got plenty of missiles. Mm -hmm. Our uh, frigates now being made are carrying 32 Barak 8 missiles, but primary role is uh, surface to air. And uh, they have other... Uh, weapons for carrying out attacks against a smaller caliber against smaller ships but the range rate of fire and in this case this is a gun for which we are going in for the uh, modification 4 that means it can fire in automated role it has a crew of 6 but in automated role in modification 4 the crew doesn't have to man it this crew of 6 is 
under the deck of the ship only the mount is outside it is mm-hmm. remote controlled it can fire 20 rounds in automatic loading mode so it's much more effective much faster rate of fire much more accurate and i don't have the details of ammunition some details have come out but if we are going in for the latest modification i suppose we probably are going in for the latest ammunition, ammunition as, well, as well which has extended range of 36 km smaller calibers have got lesser range mm-hmm. we are manufacturing the 76 mm auto melara gun by bhel under license but now that is considered an inferior caliber when the 127 is available remember we were going to go in for the auto melara 127 mm the best gun in the world but mm-hmm. we now we could not go in for that is 13 the nf number well i suppose if uh, you know we have got these 11 guns for the 11 ships mm-hmm. four a plus three under construction four are the vishakhapatnam class and uh, three of the nilgiris class and three follow up and one for training it will go to ins dronacharya one will go to ins valsura for technical maintenance uh, training mm-hmm. so yes it is not the primary weapon for these ships it is enough but i would like to add we have made the barak 8 jointly with the with israel we have made uh, the brahmos cruise missile jointly with the russians mm-hmm. and we have our drdo has made with some help from abroad our lightweight torpedoes our heavyweight torpedoes and a few other uh, important naval equipment so i think uh, there is a need for us to there are lot of weaponry lot of armament on naval ships is not of domestic manufacture it's not indigenous okay even the 76 mm we were making under license at bhel when we were going for auto melara it was going to be licensed manufacture in india mm-hmm. this one is coming without tot and direct off the shelf purchase so there is a need for offloading r and d to the private sector or jointly with drdo and and developing naval armament so that we do not have a need for such weapons our ships are full of weapons which are imported we also need the the submarines which are being made we made the missiles for them mm-hmm. or we are developing the missiles for them you carried a program the other day on the k4 mm-hmm. so why can't we develop indigenous armament for our frigates and okay, that's a new general order your comments on that because there are policies in place and there are ways wherein the government seems to be building on uh, and addressing those points which have been raised by commander singh here see experience has shown whenever technology has been denied to us we have produced results so uh, if uh, auto melara was banned and if the americans had not given us this gun we had the choice of either buying the russian a130 or developing our own so uh, when such hardship comes perhaps it has a silver lining and we do develop okay and i would like to say that we must develop because missiles are getting more advanced guns are getting more accurate deadlier and smarter both have a role and are come to stay and this is a necessity we we must we must uh, do something about it to get them in adequate numbers for our own requirements